Hello and welcome to Hollywood Blockbusters. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew Walker. Hey. And joining us again as a regular special guest is George Johnson. How are you? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> this is like Saturday Night Live. He'll stop being featured and he'll just be part of the cast. Got, are, you, are you in the five timers club yet? Are you? Uh, I, is this, this four might be four. Or four? This oh, might be four. Gonna have to yeah. get a special robe for you, made. That's right, like Saturday Night Live. Right? <laughs> now, guys, I don't know if you've noticed. But the apocalypse seems to be all the rage lately. Uh, a week or so ago, we had a new Planet of the Apes movie. I think it was, what, the fourth or fifth in the reboot series? Yeah, number four. four. Uh, yeah, and coming up uh, this upcoming weekend is the Furiosa movie, which uh, I've read some pretty good things about. Uh, one review that I read on social media said, this is the type of movie that we as moviegoers deserve instead of getting every once in 10 years. And I'm like, well, that, that's a pretty uh, yeah. heaping praise right there. So uh, on television, great. you have the Fallout uh, series, which yeah. seems to people are raving about. Two thumbs up from this yeah. guy. Yeah. And, uh, really? Is that good? That's I enjoyed what it. I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, there's what The Last of Us uh, was a very yep. popular series. And yep. I think a second season uh, has wrapped uh, production and should be premiering soon. Yep. And then, of course, there was the eclipse, which uh, everyone predicted would bring an apocalypse that never surfaced. So I think they reset the date on that. So we'll have check your calendars to find out when the next apocalypse is scheduled. But uh, I mean, that's are we talking the... microdosing or major? <laughs> what's because hurricane season hasn't started yet, Joe. <laughs> No, whenever whenever someone says uh, they set a date for like the upcoming rapture or something, I say, well, I hope it's nice weather because I want to have the top down on my convertible in case it happens while I'm driving. I want to have a clear <laughs> shot. So, um, But that's the theme of today's uh, podcast is uh, the apocalypse and post-apocalyptic movies. And I know when we came up with the idea a couple of weeks ago, you guys were like, uh, this is going to be a two-parter. I don't know if we necessarily need to go two parts, but I got my top 10 list and uh, we'll kind of, well, that's not it. We'll go around and uh, kind of comment on my top 10 list and then hear what you guys have to add that uh, we haven't covered. So, um, so as I compiled my top 10 list, I thought back, you know, to the greatest era of movies, the 80s. And one of my favorite movies to come out of the 80s um, was Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, released in 1981, uh, the follow-up follow to Mad Max, which came out in 1979. Now, I remember when the, the first movie, Mad Max, got, you know, kind of regular rotation on cable TV. It was okay. Like, it wasn't, it was kind of like this ultra-violent sort of a thing, and I, I've never really been into that ultra-violent sort of a thing. I thought the sequel superseded the first one by leaps and bounds. Oh, it turned Agreed. into the... Agreed. Mm -hmm. It turned into the post-apocalyptic wave. Like yeah. That one. yeah, because yeah, the exactly. first movie starts as quote-unquote normal, like today type of thing. Yeah. And then part two, it just all of a sudden you have the theatrics that, and the color and the... The crazy goes, it's just yeah. amazing. And the yeah. reluctant hero, the like reluctant he didn't hero. really want to be part of that society that w existed within those walls, but then he does his part to be the hero and try to save them or whatever. And, uh, and as a car guy, you know, you guys know, I love my movie car chases and movie oh, yeah. cars. Uh, Mad Max two has one of the greatest, most exciting car chases in movie history. And that's when, He's given the task of trying to lead the uh, the villains away from the compound by driving that big tanker truck, and uh, it's just thrilling, absolutely thrilling. I mean, you got the car, the little uh, Ford Falcon V8 Interceptor, which was one of the coolest movie cars, but the actual car chase involves the tanker truck with all the villains trying to catch up to him and take it over, and uh, gosh, imagine... Being a T, I think I was 15 when this came out. Imagine seeing that on the big screen for the first time. Like, this is amazing. Um, Applica now, applicants to truck driving shot up and they were, <laughs> then they realized it's not like this. No, man, this it's is a, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you will not face those type of people on your ride through Nebraska. Uh, it depends on what city you're in, I <laughs> yeah. guess, Bob. 
Um, now, as you got, oh, well, there was a sequel, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, that came out in 1985. And oh, yeah. I, I don't even know if I saw that in theaters. I think I saw that on cable. That's and for it the was, camp effect. That's yeah. purely for the camp effect. Two Tina Turner. Yeah, yeah, Tina Turner. I think it, yeah. she could have been cool, but it, 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 it was... It was, it was in my opinion terrible. It lost. It, everything looked fl- flimsy. Yeah. Ma- Mad Max Two had kind of a, a permanency. It was it it. It's like the difference between seeing Star Wars and Logan's Run. Logan's Run yeah. looked like these little cheap little sets that You're were right. cardboard and all that. The same thing happened, I think, with Part Three or with uh, Beyond Thunderdome. Yeah. Is you had these cars that looked like they were cardboard and they're kind of mm. bouncing along and <laughs> things were falling off and. And and it just didn't look like it had the same weight, and it looks like they spent all their budget on on Tina Turner. But I felt like the props department realized, oh God, we start filming tomorrow, not not yeah, six months. Yeah, there you go. Grab whatever you can. <laughs> there were some cool props, but I think it just went overboard. And I would have everything looked vulnerable to me, yeah, like well. all of the sets and everything looked ridiculous. They weren't made for speed. They no. weren't made for 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 battle. They were more made for, I don't know a a. a like a Hollywood opening or something like where you'd roll it down the street and everybody, Oh, that's cool. But not yeah. for real. Yeah. The best yeah. thing that come out of that movie was the song. He goes, we don't need another hero. Well, that's the <laughs> oh, best I thing to come about out of that. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Even though she does work beyond Thunderdome into the <laughs> lyrics, which seemed a bit forced, but, uh, but yeah, that was the best thing to come out of that. Tina, movie. we need, we need the title in there. What? <laughs> ah, crap. I'll just throw in the third stanza. Let yeah, it... uh, the tie end will be, yeah. <laughs> You ever see the uh, the Key and Peele sketch where uh, Ray Parker Jr. Uh, Jordan plays Ray Parker Jr. and he has his big hit with Ghostbusters, and that not much after that, and so he does like this commercial where he's like, "You can hire me to write the theme to your next movie," and he just sings the titles of various movies yeah. and uh, like Twelve Years a Slave. And stuff. <laughs> yeah. It is pretty damn funny. Um, <laughs> Now, as we all know, uh, the Mad Max franchise, I guess, uh, is reboot the right word? It was rebooted a few yeah. years ago with uh, Mad Max Fury Road, where Tom Hardy takes over the role as uh, Max. and uh, But really, Charlize Theron was kind of the star of that particular film. Oh, totally. Now, yeah, he hardly... He don't, I don't think he has any actual lines in that movie. Yet. Yeah, he barely he does. speaks. He does. Yeah. He has a few. <laughs> I don't remember him speaking at all. <laughs> yeah. Being on set, like, all right, where's my pages for today? Yeah, pages. Uh, now, uh, the beauty of it, that was a good movie, but also <laughs> then the juice behind it, where the behind the scenes where uh, Charlize and Hardy could not stand each yeah. other. Oh, oh yeah. is that right? Because yeah. Hardy kept showing up late for work, and oh. Charlize is a professional. If it's yeah. an eight o'clock call, she's there at eight o'clock. He yeah. shows up around ten thirty, eleven. Sometimes <laughs> later. And she's like, this is nuts. So we're filming all my scenes. Now I got to wait for you to get into the... and <laughs> now, she's And she's in the makeup, too. With yeah, the... yeah. She's, she's been there since oh, yeah, six yeah. or she's whatever. She's got all the eye black and everything, yeah. Now, when the movie came out, uh, I, initially I wasn't real interested in seeing it. And then I started getting some pretty good buzz. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go check it out in the theater. And allow me to sum up the plot. The main <laughs> characters drive from point A to yeah. point B, which is supposed to be like an oasis, utopia. The Spoiler alert, place. find out that that doesn't exist. Yeah. So then they drive from B to A, roll credits. And I'm like, this, oh, imagine the synopsis for this. Like, all right, pitch us the idea. We drive from point A to point B and B to A. And the the I think where this came from is, again, I picture this pitch meeting and they go, hey, you remember the Road Warrior? You remember that chase with the tanker truck? Remember how exciting that was? Yeah, yeah, that was great. You Let's got do it. an entire damn film. Yes. From beginning to end. That's basically one long. A two-hour car chase, yep. <laughs> now, yes, the chase was thrilling. Yes, it was all mostly practical effects. It was not a good movie. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm in the minority, but it was not a good movie to me. It was. It would have made a better video game where you're the driver of a car that has to dodge these, these desert lunatics trying to catch up to you or whatever. But it, I, it would I don't make know, a better video game than a movie. I don't know what they were trying to go for, but I think that's what. In the end, you said, okay, to keep talking about this green place. You go there, it's utter catastrophe, and you think, okay, you're gonna make up a new plan. What's the new plan? We got to go back. <laughs> what? No, 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 no. Find some other place. I maybe it's just over the horizon. Maybe you get onto the boat. And you go into the waters of the, you know, and then sail to a far green land. Something. You don't go, crap. 
Yeah. All right, we got to go back. What? They all hate us right now. <laughs> you know yeah, what would improve that movie? If they played it in kind of fast fast forward with the Benny Hill theme playing, that <laughs> might improve <laughs> that. <film. laughs> I mean, the, perf- the, I the little performances were, were, were great. Uh, the action set. You know, it, I guess it's a great. You just sit down, like, t- turn your mind off and just want to be entertained for. Don't yeah. think about the story. Don't yeah, don't yeah. worry about it. Just think about it. Just, okay. Yeah, okay. I get it. It's 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 fun. I saw it the one time, have no desire to see it again, never bought the DVD. So, of course, now with Furiosa opening this weekend, again, I'm on the fence. Now, after I read the review about this is the kind of movie moviegoers deserve, I'm like, okay, I'm intrigued. I may check it out, but I'm fully expecting it to be a... a because people, the, what people are saying about Furiosa is what they said about Fury right. Road, and I'm like, that's well, where I, call, I think it's great individual performances. They say the one, the the young lady who plays, Anna not not, Taylor. Uh, no, no, she she's great. She doesn't show up till about you know halfway through the movie. Oh, well, you've seen it already? Oh, Fur- no, no, I mean Furiosa. Yeah, these yeah. these are just the reviews. People, they, and huh. but what she's on there, she's great because it's young Furiosa. Yeah, yeah, she's a girl. Cool, yeah. So the, the the actress who plays her apparently steal her performance steals the show, and then. Taylor comes in and delivers a great performance, basically channeling Tom Hardy. Hmm. I'm not going to really? say a lot. I'm going to you are just going to see the fury. I'm like, oh wow, okay, great. And she, okay. apparently she nailed it. Yeah. And Hemsworth is the person who comes in and steals the show oh, yeah. with his performance. They thought, oh, he's going to be a carbon copy of the bad guy in the first one, in the mode and Joe. But apparently he kills it. But it's then it suffers the the solo thing. Okay, in solo, get the Millennium Falcon, meet Chewie. Do the Kessel uh, Sprice run and, and the, like just cram cover up everything and in meet there. Lando and movie. All right? <laughs> oh, don't get me started on that. That's pretty, you, you just I, to, I gotta be honest. I did like the one with Charlize Theron. What was that called? Fury Road? Yeah, yeah. Fury Road. I yeah, did yeah, yeah. like it and there were yeah. some little sub stories in there and I agree. I, I don't know how, well, I don't know what the terminology is but like you'll see them, if you see a movie there's like an A and a B and a C level in terms, and, and you probably know what the terminology is, but you have the A, which is the, the general, everybody's involved in it, and then you have like these little subplots along the way, and those are like your B stories. And then you have these little things where they're not even a story, they're just like somebody stole somebody's crackers, and then later on the other person gets it back, and that's like a C story to me. Like <laughs> Sometimes they throw that at the very end after some of the credits had rolled, the guy finally gets his crackers back or whatever. Yeah. The Babe Ruth baseball. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So to me, it, there's the A story, and I don't know what to call that, but the A story, the big story, there isn't anything there. But they do have a couple of B stories, and one of the B stories yeah. is Tom Hardy getting out of his chains and things like that, mm. and then the saving the virgins, and that was cool. Yep. Getting through. The- there was the one girl that was pregnant. There was one girl that was yeah. pregnant. Yeah. So that that was exciting to me. If you mm-hmm. if you just boil it down to, hey, we're going from point A to point B and back, I don't know. I, I I would I would question that it's really any different than than the Road Warrior. Right, right. And don't forget the smoke show Zoe Kravitz in it. Yeah. <laughs> and she's she's not bad looking. She's no. really cute. Yeah. I will fun. say this. If you took Tom Hardy out of that movie, what would have changed? Because yeah, yeah, he didn't. He was almost because a Nicholas, secondary Nicholas, character. Because Nicholas yeah. Holt's character, the 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 war boy who has like the lumps on his face, he is so cool. He flipped. He actually said, "I'm going to be," a, and then he actually tries to save the girls, yeah, yeah, the yeah. ladies. He yeah, says, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, "I thought that was cool." Yeah. So yeah. he, so could he have not done the stuff that Tom Hardy did? Right. right. And because Furiosa did the rest, Charlie's Theron did the rest, and you could have had some of the individual uh, ladies take agency and like was one of them, Zoe Kravitz, you had to load the gun. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you know. So and then th- they would have filled in the gap. So did you really need Mad Max in there? Because he didn't have any story. All the people that he's traumatized, he's lost all the people. He has those flashbacks of kids getting run over or something. So we yeah. his movie already happened. Yeah, yeah. So if he if he wasn't in this movie, what would have happened? Yeah, yeah. others would have just picked up the slack. That, might, that might be why I came that away hurts. with the, that. Uh, that hurts it. You're right. Like if yeah. if we were to delete. Just take him out. T- I agree. Yeah, all his, think of all his. Specific but he looks actions. so cool. Oh, and that thing no, no, over no. his mouth is really yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like the iconic shots. You can see some producer like that's the poster right there. That's right. With, with those fire tornado and him going. There. It's the same mentality. But this one goes to eleven. <laughs> Why don't you just make ten louder? <laughs> but this one goes to. <laughs> I want a spin spin off movie about the guy with the guitar with the, oh the flame God. shooting oh, out. Yeah, of it. Now, that was a great visual. You can't. And I'm looking at that guy going. 
just so cool, but yeah, yeah. how ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everything about the movie is way over top. I actually thought but. one of the ladies would have said, one said, well, then who burned the world? And they kick him off, they kick Nicholas Holt off the thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, are we going to answer who burned the world? That'd be pretty cool if you guys go find out. that You're talking about a B and C story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, that, because is that what destroyed the Furiosa's green place and all that kind of stuff? But no, yeah. it was voot, voot. And here's another thing. They're like, oh, this is female empowerment. We're going to channel female I'm like, great, do that. Just call it Furiosa. You don't need to put his Furiosa, a Mad Max story. You have to put his name in there, <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise, we don't know who it is. We have to. Link There's it no to, tie into the first three. Yeah, unless it's yeah. Mad Max, the big male character, then we don't know what's going on, and that's the name recognition. Yeah. Like, Maybe we could do a thing where the Millennium Falcon comes and saves <laughs> yeah. them. The convoy. Maybe. It's all part of the same universe. <laughs> now, just about every podcast we do, I do a little uh, name dropping, and uh, I'm just going to end on this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was in L.A., got tickets to see the Jimmy Kimmel show, and usually when you get tickets to a talk show, you don't know who your guest is going to be. They're, like, planning those things days in advance. Right. And so about a day or so before going to see the show, I go online and I find out that my lead guest on Jimmy Kimmel is Charlize Theron. Oh. And I got to tell you, sitting in that audience and watching her come out, she's one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen she in my is. entire life. Yeah. It's, it's unreal. It's like a, an angel among Cretans. Uh, <laughs> she was stunning. So I, just I, I found it weird when the, in Monster, I'm like, I can still see you, Charlie. Yeah, Monster. <laughs> I can still see you, Charlie. <laughs> I shouldn't feel attracted to a monster, but come on now. No, Monster, she does a really. Oh, a, yeah. Just a, anyway. Yeah, Oscar level. Oscar but you know who you weren't expecting on that show, though, Joe? Matt Damon. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no he, got, he got bumped on that episode. Yeah. I'm not sure why. I but... apologize every time. <laughs> All right, on to number two on my list. Now, this is kind of interesting because as I was compiling my list, uh, I looked at several other post-apocalyptic movie lists and uh, a lot of movies I didn't recognize or didn't see. And then all of a sudden, this movie was mentioned, and I'm like, is this a post-apocalyptic movie? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it is. And it really is one of my all-time favorite movies ever, and I am talking about The Matrix. Uh, 1999, yeah. Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, Lawrence Fishburne and Hugo Weaving as Agent Smith. Now, it's all at, at the onset of the movie, it looks like it's set in present day, and maybe there's this weird sinister uh, agency that's part of modern-day society, and then all of a sudden, the movie takes a 180, and you realize that it's all an illusion, and the movie is actually set in the not-too-distant future where... You know, like other movies uh, that we'll be getting to in a second, the technology has taken over and use humans as a energy source. So, yes, absolutely, The Matrix is a post-apocalyptic movie. Now, the first one just blew my mind. The second one was I enjoyed, but it was kind of your standard action flick fair with the uh, car chases and gunplay and all that stuff. I never really felt like they were able to capitalize on the big reveal at the end of the matrix where he flies off like Superman. Uh, and then the third one I did not care for because I liked it better when it was called the Bible. Uh, they basically took Neo and turned him into a Christ figure and they almost stole the story from the Bible verbatim. And that bothered me. It's like, no, no, <laughs> we've seen that. <laughs> because like, I, I think they realized that, that, the second movie was entertaining as an action movie because the, because the secret's out. We now know what The Matrix is now when you've seen it. So what, what can you tell me about this? What can you do? And then they were like, oh, we've got to get the key, the key master, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. okay. or, that's a Ghostbusters reference. And then, <laughs> and then the uh, gatekeeper. You, you get the architect at the end, and then he goes into the spiel, and I go, oh, for the love of Christ. You got into, like, they, they really got high on their own philosophical garbage. Yeah, yeah I agree. That Will Ferrell parodied that. <laughs> Excellent, in, in like one of the best ways. And then South Park parried it in, in like their Walmart episode. It was, it's just what are we talking? I was like, you're like the you're the sixth one that's done this. I'm like, oh, okay, oh, exactly, yeah, yeah, okay. So, oh, so I guess yeah. all of you made the same mistake because you're still talking to the guy, Colonel yeah. Sanders over here. Now, by the time we got to the third movie, pretty much the entire movie was set in the post-apocalyptic age. 
um, which made for me the movie less interesting. Like I liked the concept of this uh, computer generated reality, and they just completely got away from that by the third film. They kind of revisited it. I don't know if you guys ever saw Matrix Revel or which one Resurrection. Matrix Resurrections uh, that came out in twenty twenty one, where they got the same actors. Uh, put them back in the same environment, sort of reconstructed this computer simulation. But the weird thing, even though as much as I enjoyed seeing those actors reprising those roles, the weird thing about the movie is that they make reference to the Matrix movies. The Matrix movies exist in that reality as movies that they have seen at the movies. And I'm yep. like, okay, that's trying to be a little too... Meta. Surreal, yeah, a little too. That, yeah, I don't know. That's like George and Andrew say, like that pitch meeting. Like, <laughs> so now we're going to say it's the movies in there, and we're going to have, you know. Yeah. Oh, God. I, so, I, yeah, it's not. I don't know. If you're a fan of the movies, it might be worth seeing. And like I said, I really enjoy the actors. I, I don't understand why Carrie Ann Moss isn't a bigger star. God, when she uh, came onto the scene with The Matrix, I fell madly in love. I'm like, She's the most awesome woman I've ever seen. I haven't and checked she, her IMDb. Did she do like maybe more independent drama she projects, and she didn't want to do like blockbuster things, stuff? Yeah, but I I'll never understand why she didn't take that momentum from the Matrix movies and do, you know, other kick-ass, strong female action or, roles. Did she go into like she was in Memento? Remember, uh, yeah, the yeah, Christopher Nolan, yeah, and uh, Jessica Jones. That. She was in Jessica Jones, the, the, right. the Marvel show. But that was a TV show. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was great in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll never understand it. I, I thought she was going to be the next big thing. She, she's in the upcoming, the next uh, Star Wars series called the, yeah. the, the Acolyte. Acolyte, Acolyte. Acolyte that comes out next month. Yeah, and now that's funny. When I saw the trailer, I didn't recognize her. And then I saw somewhere, it's like, yeah, Carrie Ann Moss is in. I'm like, where was she in the trailer? And then I kind of watched it and said, oh, is that her? Yep, yep. So I'm kind of excited about that. I yeah, mean, yeah, me and, too. You know, to get on board the Star Wars universe, that's pretty big. But I, I wish she would have done that 10, 15, 20 years ago. But, and um, she looks great in a Victorian era bustle and, and, and what is it, a big, beautiful. She's in another, I'm trying to find it, yeah. but she's in a movie where she's playing, you know, kind of the upper crust of, of British society. Hmm. And she rocks it. She's so good looking. She's just awesome at it. But I, I got to find it. But I mean, to go from somebody who can, he's wearing those really tight, like shiny pants, <laughs> kicking everybody's butt. The latex, to, yeah. The latex, yeah. And going to this, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's so cool that she can rock both of those, I mean, those yeah. categories. Yeah. She, and that somebody saw her yeah. and said, I think we can use her over here. You know, <laughs> does it do a 180. Anyway, what were you going to say? No, she came up with like the most iconic pose. They all, everyone like tried to oh copy that. That first time she. Go, she leaps goes, up yeah, and the go, camera the rotates yeah. around her. Oh my god! And people yeah. are like, "What the hell's happening right now?" I'm like, "Oh, so iconic!" And she was great in it. God, she was great. All right, the next movie <laughs> on my list. Uh, we kind of did a deep dive on our time travel episode uh, not too long ago, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But um, this is an interesting entry on my list because it doesn't necessarily focus on the post-apocalyptic world, even though we get glimpses of it. We basically see what leads up to it and that's the terminator movies right so in uh the 1984 terminator uh we have the t-800 who comes back tries to kill the leader of the resistance uh he fails and then they follow up uh with t2 in 1991 which in my opinion is one of the greatest movies ever made and uh and to a lesser extent but i actually did enjoy uh, part three, Rise of the Machines. That's where they introduce uh, Kristana Loken as uh, the female Terminator, TX, or some people call her the Terminatrix. Um, but that trilogy, now I, I'm not I'm not even going to get into the ones beyond that. I didn't care for any of those movies beyond the third one. Um, but would you agree that the Terminator franchise should be considered post-apocalyptic? Sure. Nick? He's staring off into the distance. Yeah, because I'm trying to think, because most of the movie does take place... In the present. Yeah, in the day. present, and it's to avoid the post-apocalyptic. So, yeah. you know, I don't know any of the characters in the post-apocalyptic era. They all, yeah. They're all here in the, in the here now trying to stop it, so... But I we do get glimpses of the machines and yeah. the hunter-killer assassin things and the 
and the T-800s like stomping on skulls. And so we do get a glimpse of that future. And I think some of the later movies, maybe the one with Christian Bale, yeah. really do oh, a they, deep oh, yeah, dive they take place in that. The, yeah, they they yeah. stay back. There's no time travel there. They're, they're just plop. They're going to stay right there and yeah. and do that. So uh, it's tough for me to call term. I, I get it. I wouldn't look. If, if someone's called Terminator post-apocalyptic, I'm not going to put up a fight on that one. That's yeah. not. I see it. I obviously can see it. Uh, that I that that's a is a valid point. Me personally, I think it's more action. I I can't see it as post apocalyptic only because they're trying to stop it. It'd be like if in a supernatural one, what could happen to you, young knight, if you don't stop the evil wizard? <laughs> yeah, Look, yeah. This is your future. This is your future. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. Oh my god! And they show a post apocalyptic world where everyone's <laughs> in slavery. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. And and it doesn't have to go that route. Right. If you take action now, you can prevent that future from happening. So, um, all right, George, anything you want to add to that, or can we move on to the next one? Because I'm really excited about talking about this next one with you. Because we kind of got into it in our little uh, Facebook chat here. Let's get let's get into it. I okay. am talking about the 1995 <laughs> film Waterworld, ah. starring <laughs> Kevin Costner. Uh, the beautiful Gene Triplehorn, uh, Dennis Hopper as the villain Deacon. Um, now, I saw this movie in the theaters, and I fully enjoyed it and was surprised by the reaction. Like, I'm like, was I the only one who enjoyed this film? It got pretty bad feedback, and it became synonymous with the biggest bombs in box office history. It replaced Cleopatra, Joe. It, yeah, and, and uh, Heaven's say. Gate and all those movies that were associated with excess and failure, Waterworld sort of inher- inherited that mantle. One quick thing, when George and uh, uh, Joe were talking about this, and I can't speak for Andrew, but I was doing the uh, the John Stewart popcorn gift, just watching popcorn, <laughs> watching. Now, let me pull out my essay. That's right. You had an essay. You said actually wrote an essay on it. (laughs) You need to stand if you're going to deliver an essay. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, I implore you. Uh, (laughs) I did a little. I did a little research here, and according to Wikipedia, that's all you need now. um, Here's the film's budget uh, at the time. This is 1995 dollars. Was 172 million dollars. Now back in 1995. Money, that, that might have been one of the most expensive films of all time. And whenever you shoot a film on the water, As like just ask Spielberg, uh, the budget skyrockets yeah. when you're filming on the ocean. There's typhoons and all kinds of stuff. Um, so the budget was $172 million plus marketing and distribution costs for a total of $235 million investment on this film. Uh, in North America, it grossed 88 million. So that's probably where the perception comes that it was a box office disaster. But overseas, it took in $176 million in foreign markets. And so if you combine those totals, it actually grossed during its initial run 264 million, which exceeds the expenses. Now, do you want to invest two hundred and thirty-five million just to earn thirty-five million? It doesn't sound, you know, all that smart. But the reality is, it did make money. Um, the The newest box office disaster. What did I just see the other day? Um, there's a movie that came out recently that is the new champion of biggest box office disasters of all time. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? I might have to look this up. But it's no. a recent movie. I, I th- want to say it's a Disney film. I think I think the last Pirates of the Caribbean. I, it was like over three hundred million budget, and I yeah. I don't know. If, I don't. Those if it were made all it back. considered. I think box office. I mean, those were critical failures. The 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 sequel and the third one, but I think they all made money. I think the Pirates movies. I'll have to think about the new crown of 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 biggest losses, but most of the biggest losses have come from Disney, which is, yeah. is so surprising. I, I, I love your technical justification. Well, technically it made money, and then that's what the <laughs> the exec that says that is being fed to the lions <laughs> later on by the board. Yeah. But, I mean, it, you know, it, it made, you know, $30 million. I'm not going to sneeze at uh, Now, out of curiosity, I went to Rotten Tomatoes, and critics have uh, ranked Waterworld at 47%. 
And what shocked me even more is that audiences have it at 43%. And I'm like, did we see the same movie? I actually enjoyed it. Now, has Kevin that gone, Costner, Has that gone up over the years? I think people are becoming more forgiving over the years. Well, that I sounds like that's pretty been, low to me. That's, yeah. Those are both oh, no, they're, they're rotten to me. Yeah, they're single-digit scores out there for some Yeah, major. that's true. Now, Kevin Costner is Kevin Costner. He, he, I don't even think he's acting. I think he just plays Kevin Costner. Even when he's yeah. playing Robin Hood, he's Kevin yeah, Costner, was... who gives up on a British accent a third of the way through the movie. Um, so, you know, Kevin Costner's not the most dynamic actor in the world, but he's, he's you know, with Dances with Wolves and stuff, he's, he's you know, adequate. Um, so I don't know if he was the best lead for this film. He's probably the reason it got made, because he was a big star at the time. Um, I thought Dennis Hopper was great as the villain. Now, are there plot holes? Yes. So here's one. I was, I was talking to Ian, who's the executive director here at Owen TV, and we were talking about some of the plot holes of Waterworld. So one of the plot points that drives the movie along is this quest for land, for dry, dry land, and that a handful of dirt is worth more than gold in this, this world, this water-soaked world. And they were, there's a map on, tattooed on someone's back that, takes you to this plot of land that's sticking out of the water that has covered the earth. What is that land? What, what, what could be breaching the surface of the water? And the obvious answer is Mount Everest. Now the follow-up question is, is it scientifically possible to cover the entire planet in water with only the peak of Mount Everest sticking up out of the water? I don't think the science is adding up on this. I don't know. Yeah. So those are the plot holes where a lot of people dismiss it as sort of a silly movie that, uh, you know. It felt it felt like Republican Senate science. I remember <laughs> the, the senator from Oklahoma took like a giant block of ice and said, so if we just keep adding ice, you think it's going to spill over like this? This is what's happening is what you're saying? I said, that's not how global warming works, but all right. So are there plot holes? Yes. Is it an entertaining movie? Yes. And then that's all I ask for in a movie. You know, I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm like Maximus and Gladiator. Are you not entertained? Yes, I was entertained by Waterworld. Um, I'm glad that it is no longer the poster boy for excess and, uh, Hollywood flops. Oh, um, yeah. but I don't think it deserves the, these rotten tomato scores. I think people, I don't know. I think they they think they should hate it, so they give it bad reviews. But I mean, in this modern day, Joe, there there are movies that get hate bombed, yeah, by bots and stuff. So they, oh, uh, exactly. we're we're in a new era where yeah. maybe back then they were more. Who knows? Maybe there was a hate campaign out there. Yeah, I yeah, hate, I, I, I hate Kevin Costner. I think well, I think it was like an anti Costner because he was so successful at that time. I think it was sort of an anti Hollywood movement. Like I'll never uh, forgive you for making Sir Robin of Locksley from <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> we're gonna take that pompous guy down. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't get the hate. I, I will say this. If you get a chance to revisit Waterworld or if you've just never seen it because you've heard bad things about it, give it a chance. I don't know. I, no, that's true. That's true. I've, I've watched movies where initially when I was a teenager, I was like, oh, my God, this is hot garbage. Then as I get older, I go, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're right. Now, the opposite is true, too, where I, there's been movies – that I purposely avoided because I heard really bad things about it. And then I said, you know, I'm going to give this movie a chance. And then I sat down and turned it off and said, that was awful. So, George, you've been uh, curiously silent over there. I want to hear your feedback. I know you might every, every time I want to jump in, and you guys say something, and I go, oh, and then I forget what I said. So, anyway, it is. So, what are your, what's your take on Waterworld? I've only seen half of it. <laughs> Which half? The first half. Um, I have a real problem with staying awake in movies where I feel like they're derivative of like five other things. And that felt, I don't remember what it was, but it felt like I'd seen it before. And my question is, is how can you make a map if the entire world's covered by water? I mean, what, what, what are your roads? Like if everything's waterborne, how do we know that this thing isn't like 50 miles north? I mean, like, you, does that make sense? I you mean, now know why the audience are all cartographers who were just like bombing this movie. <laughs> you turn I left at the wave and then go right to the swell yeah. and then go north until you see water. I don't know. I, it, anyway, that's... Uh, you know, you just made me think of another huge problem with the film. And uh, I don't know, maybe you'll sway me over to your side, but 
Another issue I remember having with the film is trying to figure out how many generations of human beings lived in this water drenched oh, world. Oh, yeah. And how long did it take? Because one of the reveals in the movie is that Kevin Costner's character has developed gills, which allows him to stay underwater longer. How many generations would it take for a human being to evolve gills? Like we're talking, we about have to talk minimums. millions of yeah. years, not not a few years. I mean, unless there's some very wild stuff happening at some parties with a lot of drugs and, and stuff that you know, even God would be like, that's not right. So I don't think that's something that's ever addressed. Like how many generations later? There were a lot of things the not world addressed flooded. in that script, yeah, yeah. In, that, in that pitch meeting. There, so. I, I also have just a problem with Co Kevin Costner um, because I hated Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> I liked the beginning. I thought it was really cool. Um, uh, what's it called? Dances with Wolves. I thought it was a really cool idea. And then we get about halfway through it, and I just feel like it's it's uh, a John Wayne movie kind of a thing. There's a few things that, that is ripped off from John Wayne movies. Mm -hmm. And I got sick of seeing Kevin Costner with a sunrise or sunset behind him in like 50% of the shot. It's like <laughs> it can't always be that everything happens at this golden hour, you know. <laughs> And so after I saw him swimming naked, you can only see his butt, but in, <laughs> in, uh, what do you call it? In, uh, uh, Robin Hood, I just thought this guy just wants the cameras pointed at him. That's it. That's all he wants. And, yeah. and that's what he's, so I had, I hate to say it. I gave up on it. And then also, um, I, I, I saw a little bit of the, the postmaster or something like that. Postman. The postman. Yeah. Now that. From what, from what I've read, is a true box office disaster. It, I thought it was a disaster. It had no, miserably. yeah, and I don't know where he gets the money or that. But I, I, I don't know. You come up with a couple of good things like Shyamalan, and then you surround yourself with, I don't know, you put yourself inside of a bubble and you surround yourself with sycophants and Prince boot, of, Prince bootlickers. Of, yeah. and, Prince of Thieves was the, uh, I, I feel like the, the original sin, one of the original sins where the British said, oh, you're going to take, you're going to put an American in <laughs> as... As little John, as <laughs> as uh, what's his face? Um, they do it to all the time to us. I mean, look who look who Superman is. Yeah, so I mean, look who yeah, Christian Bale, Morgan Freeman, and Kevin Costner playing three major roles. I'm like, oh, is that how you want to play it? Yeah, <laughs> take Superman, take Batman, take it all. Oh, they're taking all the roles. I can't. Oh, you love your, Do you love your little Americana <laughs> former colony? Um, I want to throw out real quick. I did look up uh the the current champion of box office disasters, number one. Coming out in 2023, the Marvels is oh, the yeah. current reign, a uh, current reigning champion with a worldwide gross of uh, 237 million dollars. That that, that's a loss. Their loss is 237 oh, million dollars. Was that with Brie Larson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they yeah. took female characters from different Marvel properties, put them I all in one movie. I watched a little bit of that. And Some people say it's not answers. terrible. I had no interest in seeing it, but that is uh, currently holds the record for. Most losses, uh, which was previously held uh, by John Carter, which is another oh, movie yeah, that Disney. people say isn't a terrible movie. But there's this Hollywood thing that uh, any movie that uh, is set on Mars or is connected to Mars in some way or has Mars in the title uh, is cursed, uh, even though it didn't really apply to The Martian because yeah. it was a pretty good movie. Um, Martian but yeah, was great. They removed it, originally the title was John Carter of Mars. They removed of Mars because they thought that was cursing the film. Um, but that was the, the reigning champ until the Marvels uh, took the crown. So. I, I, you got to tip your hat to the, to the marketing person. Can we take away of Mars? Yeah. You know, the trailer's coming out, right? <laughs> you know, what's in the trailer, right? Frank, <laughs> it's a bunch of Martians. He says it. Yeah. <laughs> That's you see it crossed out and yeah. says in New Mexico. Yeah. That's, a, that's probably the, where they filmed they're, it. They're not going to think he's in Tunisia or something. Come on. <laughs> All right. Enough uh, Enough bashing poor Kevin Costner. He was great, by the way, in Untouchables and JFK. Yes. And he, does, he has some pretty good performances under oh, his belt. Oh, JFK. Don't get me started on that That's one. another podcast. That's another we'll get into that podcast later. All right, number five on my list. Uh, this, again, this, gosh, we'll probably talk about this for the next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to start off with Planet of the Apes, 1968, Charlton Heston, Riley McDowell, Kim Hunter. Now, the, the cool twist on this is that here are these astronauts think that they're leaving Earth and traveling to a distant planet. Uh, they go into hypersleep or whatever. They crash land in this lake. 
emerge from their capsule thinking they're on some alien world that's run by these apes that are in charge. And then, of course, spoiler alert, big twist. Uh, they realize they never left Earth. They just traveled far into the future. And I looked this up. When when was the original Planet of the Apes set? Uh, the year 3978 is the year that uh, Charlton Heston emerged from his slumber. Um, and so, yes, this is a post-apocalyptic movie because it's taking place thousands of years after they left where... Um, the apes have taken over. Now, one of the unanswered questions of the original series of movies that got <laughs> progressively worse and low budget until they got to the point where, like, we're only going to have two monkeys in this one. Um, the problem was they never really fully explored why this happened. If it, this was set in the distant future of Earth, what caused this to happen? Which brings us to the reboot that explains what happens and is fairly believable. Fairly logical. I mean, the 68 one had the Cold War vibes. You kind of say, mm -hmm. I think, you maniacs, you blow it up. I'm like, yeah, they yeah. probably did, Charles. And then this one, they went, let's not, let's not do that. Let's yeah, do yeah. That one, but but in, that def in their defense on that one, that was the reveal. At the yeah. very end was, the very oh, end, yeah. you're here. So you couldn't give a backstory to something that was, that was, the, that was the dynamite that you know ended right. the story. You couldn't yeah. do that. So I think that when they did the second and third one, they just said, we didn't explain it before. Why would we do it now? I don't know. I only saw the second one on TV like a million years ago with a bunch of ads in between, and I didn't see third part, so I don't know. Yeah. Now, the Tim Burton version, which uh. I think we've bashed on this podcast before, they took the fallen Statue of Liberty concept and turned it on its ear and reveals a Lincoln memorial with a monkey sitting in the chair. And I'm like, come on, man. So even though Joey, my coworker is like, well, that was one of my favorite movies of the whole franchise. I'm like, God, no, nobody's perfect. Me. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> now the reboot that uh, started uh, with Andy Serkis uh, playing Cornelius, I think. Does he play Cornelius or Caesar? Caesar. I think Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. yeah. I think Cornelius is Caesar's son. Right. Um, but those movies, I saw all of them except for this current one, which I plan on seeing. I've seen all of them in the theaters, and they, I think they are underrated in that it doesn't seem like a lot of people talk about the technology. The the computer animation in these reboots is spectacular. Yeah. yeah. It's really amazing. Um, and I don't know if people are going to the theater to watch these movies, but I think they're they're pretty darn good. Now, have I bought them on DVD? Have I rewatched them multiple times? No, not really. Um, but I have seen all of them in the theaters, and I've really enjoyed all of them. So, um, so that, that's uh, that's number five on my post-apocalyptic movies list. Uh, you guys agree that, of course, the Planet of the Apes franchise yes. belongs on that list? Absolutely, absolutely. yes, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. I just like the French going, "Uh huh." You see, the Statue of Liberty lasted that many years. You're welcome. We'll never talk French engineering again. It survived a nuclear Americans. explosion. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Call us frogs, will you? <laughs> I can think of a thousand things that the French would say, like, you see what happened here? <laughs> this is what, why did we give this to this moron? <laughs> they just British, no problem, have no problem. Many years take our toys and go Spanish. home. <laughs> why would you put a statue living like that right by the water? It's salt. <laughs> Pay attention. That's right. You ever seen pictures of the Statue of Liberty where it's its original copper color? Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty neat. Have you ever seen pictures where it's just them trying to raise money for 10 years? It's just... It's yeah, just like a the, part of it. Yeah, it's yeah. just the hand with yeah. the, with the torch in Central in uh, Central Park. Yeah, and wow. they're like, there's actually more of a of a of a statue here. We just need to find a place for it, and we need to have the money to get the rest of it here and yeah. assemble it. Yeah, but I love okay. the fact that they use that. It's so iconic because yeah. when I was a kid, that was the reveal in the first Planet of the Apes. Yeah, it just knocked me out. I'm like. <gasps> What? Yeah, one of the it greatest great. twists of all time. It's pretty awesome. And I've visited the beach where they filmed that, and it's pretty cool to you could just see imagine the, the sad commentary in the education system. Oh, my God, is that Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> it was Chicago. No, it's it's Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. There's a Statue of Liberty, and then the pyramids are over here. And there's a... But I do think at some point in the future, if we have another episode, we should have an episode about over overreacting or overacting, yeah. and I think that's going to make my <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah damn you damn you i like when uh what uh jay from jay and silent bob kind of parried it and yeah. he's, he goes damn yous damn yous all the hell yeah. that's pretty funny. 
Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to kind of quickly go through the next couple of films and then we'll sort of go around. Um, I asked my buddy, uh, Joey, my coworker, I'm like, does this count? Wally, 2008 Pixar film that won 2009 Best Animated yes. Feature Film of the Year. Uh, here's here's my quick take on Wally. I remember seeing it in the theater because at the time during that era, it was must must see TV. I mean, you had to be in a the theater to see a Pixar movie. And I remember coming out of that theater like depressed, like man, that was a really oh yeah, uh, that's a really uh, what's the word cynical look at the future. And I'm like, really, is that where we're headed? And it, uh, initially, it wasn't one of my favorite Pixar movies because I thought it was the most cynical and dark Pixar movie to date. Now, in hindsight, it's a freaking documentary. Like it that's really exactly where, where we're, we're going. going. And and the fact that these Pixar creators nailed it actually nailed brings it. it up on my list. Like, wow! So they, you solve yeah. diabetes, <laughs> heart, heart disease, and stroke, but you can't grow any plants. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's still insanely fat and just floating around. Yeah, on these and, little... and they got those monitors, you know, the computer screens right yeah. up against their face. And I'm telling you, anytime I've ever had lunch or dinner with a friend, that's what I'm thinking of, is I'm staring at the back of a phone while I'm trying to have a conversation. And I don't know if you guys have experienced this where – I'll be telling a story to a friend of mine and they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah. And they have no idea what I'm saying to them. And I could just be spewing out anything. It's like, you know, I once killed 12 men with my bare hands. And they're like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You should have taken it back. I did. I did that to a friend. Uh, They were doing that. And I said, uh, and uh, you'll need the antidote in five minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, what did you say? Wait, huh? What? So, so the thing about Wally is I saw that with my children in, in the actual, theater and about 15 minutes into it i wanted to cry because right. it was so bleak <laughs> I and i thought this is a kids movie are they trying <laughs> to indoctrinate kids to say guys we effed things up our parents and our grandparents effed things up maybe you guys should just be taught the truth right now in a yeah. pixar movie that this is what you have to look forward to and maybe you can make sense of this but i i can't it's such a it's a love story. I mean, that movie to me is one of the perfect movies. It's a love story. Right. Yeah. It's it's a it's an amazing the first thirty minutes, there's maybe two or three lines grand total. They do everything with just Basically. him walking around and I'm glued. I'm on the edge of my yeah. seat going, What's he gonna do now? Where is he going? What's happening? Uh Fred Willard, you know, uh-huh. hey guys, we gotta get off the planet and all this he's just perfect for that. Uh, by and large, there's just so many so many little nuances, and then when the new one comes, it looks like an apple that's shaped into a woman, right? Like mm-hmm. it's, got, it's got the same white and, and yeah. the blue and, and all the colors of apple. Yeah. She comes down and kick, kicks everybody into the butt, and you just think, <laughs> oh, what's going to happen? You don't really know it's a, a woman until later, and then there's this, this love thing, and they're trying to... And then they show the people, and you kind of get lost in this other thing, and then they show the people, and you go... Oh my gosh! This this is where we're headed. Yeah. There's no reason for us to do anything, and these guys are so heavy that they're like, "We're going to have <laughs> children." It's like, are you implying that we've gotten to the point where we're so heavy that we can't have sex to be able to have children, <laughs> or that we've gotten to the point where we can't sustain life? I, I don't know. There was yeah, just yeah. so many things in there, and it, mean, and it was horrific. Yeah, and I'm that's enjoying how I it. Felt when I saw it. And yeah. I'm all, it's also very cynical. And at the very end, they tie it and they say, we're going to grow pizza on trees. You know, it's like, oh, that makes it, I mean, it's <laughs> funny, but it makes it even more painful. <laughs> it's more, it's tragic. It is, it's tragic. Anyway, yeah, there yeah. it is. I, I'd, I'd love for, I just, now when George told me that, I just hope his, his kids at the end of the movie go, Daddy, why? And he just like breaks like the last. Why'd you do it, Dan? Why'd you make me? Watch Why'd you guys that? do it? Do you remember the Indian with the tears yeah. looking around? That's exactly the way I felt. I yeah. mean, just terrible. But it's such. It is a beautiful and horrific movie at the same time, and it's unsettling AF. Does mommy yeah. know? Oh boy! Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, it was mommy's idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, now these next four movies on my list. Actually, there's there's a total of six movies, but I've kind of condensed them to four. This brings up an interesting quandary here. Now, as I was looking up lists of post-apocalyptic movies, I can't believe I've been saying post-apocalyptic correctly the whole time. But um, as I was looking up lists, I started to see some overlap, and I began to realize, are all zombie movies post-apocalyptic movies 
because they all basically have the same underlying themes of science or nature going wrong and decimating the population with packs of uh, people who've somehow dodged the bullet. Um, and I, be I began to see a lot of lists that had zombie movies on it. Uh, so before I get into these titles, what are your thoughts? Let's start with you, Nick. Are all zombie movies post-apocalyptic movies? Most of them are because that's how the story's written. But there's one out there that I wouldn't call it post-apocalyptic, and it's World War Z. Mm -hmm. Not what the weird Brad Pitt action movie that came out there that just happens to have the, the same actual name. book. But the actual book and the actual mm -hmm. uh, audio book that they made with the full cast. Mm -hmm. That one, they... They it's they report on it ten years after the whole zombie epidemic that came out. Mm -hmm. There's still society. They're rebuilding. They in that one they endured it. They broke into chapters and they took back the planet. Mm -hmm. Like, like so they the prevented that path. Well, no, they suffered losses. I mean, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In, in in that story, uh, out of you know three hundred plus million people in America, there were over two hundred million zombies. So you lost oh, two thirds geez. of the population. Wow. But they the rest took back. They went by a line. Literally, they formed a line and went yeah, inch by inch and took systematically back from took, from took California back, yeah. to Boston wow. to New York. They took back everything. They said because that the president of the time said we're going to do this. Other countries said no, we're just going to wait out the zombies. Like so, they're dealing with the consequences. Wow. Whereas Canada, America, Mexico made this line and went across. It's kind of like hands across America, but yeah, like, basically. Like <laughs> and 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 they and Mark Hamill plays one of the soldiers mm. and he talks about what it was like. He's like, I thought I was in. Uh, at it easy in the north because we, you know, only fight for like three months, and then get, we get to wait. But man, those winters were brutal. We lost more people, and so interesting. It's a social. It's more of a social commentary. What's yeah. that called? World, World War, War Z, Z by yeah. Max Brooks. The, no Brooks. The book I is have not excellent. seen that. If you get to read the book, you excellent. can. But there's excellent. an audio. If you just, you know, people are busy, so they just have the audio drama. Oh wait, I, have, I thought I had Brad Pitt in it. No, no, that was the movie, the movie yeah. version. They're they, talking about the, yeah, don't, the book don't bother and the, with uh, the audio you, book. If you, yeah. if you watch the movie, just call it Brad Pitt action movie. And it has, yeah. it's, not, it's nothing to do with World War Z. Yeah, it has the yeah. it has the title and maybe one character name. Everything else is nothing nothing to do with the book. That that would be good. To, I, I think they should do like a ten part TV series. Le Leo based and, on the book. That Leo, would be exactly great. Leo. Not a movie. Andrew's right. Leo and Brad uh, Brad Pitt were fighting for the rights for it from Max Brooks, and they. Brad, Brad Pitt won the rights, and this is before streaming kicked in. This is 2006. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So they said, oh, well, let's just make it a movie, and they wanted to make a sequel. Had they known streaming was coming, this would have been a perfect Perfect, thing. Yeah. This thing would have beaten they could still Walking do Dead. And they probably can. <laughs> if they, yeah, exactly right. If they re-get the rights, this is one of the most adaptable products. You would get the – this would blow Walking Dead out of Did you guys like yeah. Walking Dead? I did initially. Early on, I liked yeah. the first three seasons. Yeah. I watched the first it, season and it just like uh... it overstayed its welcome yeah. and and I really enjoyed it for oh. a number of years but it overstayed its welcome it, it, and it jumped its own shark yeah, yeah. at the end yeah. of season one because in the in the in the graphic novel the uh, Robert uh, Robert Kirkman never addresses what caused the whole thing yeah. it's, just, it's a zombie outbreak it, it happened you know deal with it yeah for whatever reason in the t in the in the TV show at the end of season one they said oh it's in the air everybody's infected. Yeah, they did the big reveal where someone died and then came yeah, back. And, to, and they died of natural yeah. causes, like you know, you could die of like you know bad, bad, you know bad fast food, and then you just like you come back as your zombie. I'm like, oh, yeah. so if you know that's the case, nothing else matters. It, it's yeah. gonna be like I'm going to start a farming village. Like you better figure this out because you can't sleep next to your wife. What if you die in, at at night? You're going to turn on an eater. Yeah, yeah, Everybody's, exactly. So they never addressed that in the show. I'm like, once you did that, you have to solve this problem, and they never got around to solving it. What What's that called when? You leave gigantic gaps in the script where if somebody just thinks about it for half a second, back to the future, what we were when we were doing yeah. the, the the back we're talking about back to the future a few episodes ago, one of the things that you brought up, Nick, was you don't ask this I don't remember what it was specifically, but you you just don't ask this question. But left to your own devices, left just sitting in the audience, if you start putting two and two together, you're like, but wait a minute, wouldn't that mean that this, and doesn't that mean, yeah. what is that called when you have gigantic gaps like that that are easy for people and, and are never addressed? Is there a term for that? I there don't should know if be. there is a term. It's um, a Joe Johnson is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a MacGuffin. No. A, a MacGuffin is uh, is something that kind of propels the storyline forward. Either it's like a logic um, jump or a plot hole. It's a combination. It's yeah. like a... It's it's a cousin of one of those two. But some of these have so many of those that you just go, that doesn't make sense. Why would she wind up here, and why would they have control of this when 
they already, you know, I don't know. It, and it's their own rules. You know, you, you it's know. their own rules. When you establish the rules, and then I expect you to abide by it. I'll give you yes. all the leeway. You, yeah, yeah. it's your then story. Then it's breaking your own rules. Yeah, that's you, what it is. And you, because oh, you know what? It's uh, uh I, sometimes I think the term is dos ex mach. It's dos ex because they dos have dos ex have, machina. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, we just have to. Got you know? Oh, they just autom- oh, hey, I have this random thing that'll solve all the all the problems. Didn't you know that? I hate that because they yeah. roll themselves yeah. into a corner. Yeah, they do. Yeah, a lot of movies they they do that with the like the mothership. So like, let's say there's an alien invasion, everything looks lost, and they go, well, if we just destroy the mothership, all the aliens will fall over and die. And I'm they like, they did that in Marvel. Come on, in, man. Uh, and it, that is such a trope. <laughs> in, That's in, been done kind of. so many. Times. My friend was a computer engineer, a computer science major at the time. He looked at, he said. So you're telling me that that computer's interfacing with that alien, that uh, alien computer Independence Day? That's what took me out. I'm like, that's what took you out of the movie, not the 25 mile <laughs> ships and all this stuff. That's what broke you. I'm like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> Excuse me. I get it. I, the I, Phantom I, Menace did it. The Phantom yeah. Menace did it. You kill the mothership and all the robots fall down. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, they. I liked it when they used that idea in the War of the Worlds, the original War of the Worlds. Like, yeah. they got a virus, <laughs> and then yeah. and then uh, what is it? Morgan Freeman comes in at the end and says, you know, we fought. You know, America or humans fought to be on this planet because the viruses and we've earned our place. I buy it. I bought it. I loved it. I thought yeah. it was great. But that's an interesting flip on that. Where you're, I don't, I don't know. You said you said the original War of the Worlds, and then you mentioned Morgan Freeman, and I'm like, no, sir. The original no, 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 War of the Worlds of the 1950s, 50s. even though it was yeah. the same thing. That Although it was for, for, basically the common cold that wiped out the that's, entire. Yeah, I, 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 okay. So I should have said, and in the, <laughs> and in the updated version, when Morgan Freeman. No, but you're exactly right. The old, the old, and the old one's super cool. The it old is. ones are so stylish. I, I, and the I, ships so are cool. cool. I hope yeah. I hope NASA's paying attention, fellas. Remember when we go someplace. Wear a mask. Wear a mask now. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to get any like. Bring some pure. We went through COVID. Don't give me this. Just wear it. Wear it. We're not gonna. We didn't build a hyperdrive engine and break. You know, watch physics. Alien. Yeah. Watch yeah, right. Aliens and just don't ever let him out of quarantine ever. Exactly. Oh, that exactly. could be another episode. Of sci-fi things that bug you, like in Prometheus. <laughs> coochie, coochie, like the. Thing. Oh, it's hissing at you, man. <laughs> Blow it away. Um. Now you, you know you were talking about. This is gonna, I'm going to kind of set you up for this, but as you were talking about uh, World War Z, that's what it's called, right? Mm-hmm. World War Z. Um, I remember when I saw it, I kind of enjoyed it, but what sort of took some of the wind out of the sail is when it comes to zombie flicks, uh, it's been done to death. And so I'm always looking for a zombie flick that does something different, that takes the the trope and, and does something different or fun with it. And as I'm watching World War Z, I'm thinking, well, we've seen this before. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but 28 Days Later came out before World War Z, yes. right? Oh, yeah. And what 28 Days Later introduced to the genre are the cheetah-like zombies, the ones that you see in the distance, and they're coming at you in a full sprint. Now, I, I don't think that had ever been that. done before 28 Later, and yeah. that was scary as hell. That was. Yeah. Now, that was a movie you said you wanted to talk about today, so I'll, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk oh, about Oh, no, that's 20. Andrews. Oh, was that yours? Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Andrew. <laughs> we finally it's give Andrews some time. <laughs> so talk about why 28 uh, Days Later you're, is on You're here. exactly right. That was the first movie, as, as far as I know, I... I guess I haven't really researched it, but yeah, that introduced the extremely fast zombie, not the slow lurking zombies of, of George Romero. <laughs> yeah. D- Dawn of the dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I saw this in the theater when I was, I, I was probably 16 or 17 when it came out and I absolutely loved it. It, yeah. it, it really did terrify me. So that R Big rating, time. that R rating didn't deter you. No, I, I stuck in, <laughs> I stuck into Great Lakes Crossing theater and saw, uh, um, American Beauty when oh, I was yeah. when I was fifteen. So there you go. I, I, the ratings I, are mere. I love that movie. I, 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 I knew how to how to sneak movie. in pretty easily at that theater. Anyway, no this this movie was a game changer for me. Uh, yeah. for for the the horror genre, big time. Yeah. Um, now, didn't in a way, oh, Walking Dead sort of stole a page from Twenty Eight Days Later too because. Uh, 28 days later, does, doesn't he awake? Uh, Killian Murphy like awakes from a coma or something to find the world. Similar is, to yeah, uh, yeah. that's exactly what happened to Andrew Lincoln. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, uh, he was a bicycle carrier, mm-hmm. Killian Murphy, and he went to a coma from an accident before the virus the happened. Outbreak. Yeah, yeah. Um, he wakes up naked in a hospital, and he's just kind of 
trying to make his way out to the the surface on uh, in London. Okay. And you see the city completely completely deserted. I don't know exactly how they filmed that. And now I, one of the biggest cities in the I world. I read that there's no CGI in those scenes that they I, filmed like early, early in the morning when there I, was like. I read no that traffic. too, and I, I I've rewatched it several times, and I've tried to try to see uh, did they do some tricky editing here yeah, they might have done they some might have but like, see I, a plane flying across yeah that was a while ago in 2002 and i don't i don't think they really really did much uh cgi with that yeah but, yeah yeah ex- uh, great great movie and yeah what i love about that movie is how later on they get to the army base and they're like okay you know we found we found uh some safety some right we we don't have to keep Running after these guys, then they they get to the army base, and those guys are worse than the zombies. <laughs> They're trying to make the two females sex slaves. Oh, jeez, I, uh, I don't remember that part for some reason. It it, it wasn't really like overt, like they didn't call them it's, sex it's slaves. A lot of a lot of implied stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, yeah. Um, and then the the part where they they had one of their soldiers who turned, but they kept him chained up to observe him, mm. and he just keeps like. Throwing up blood. That was Ugh, terrifying. Huh. And wow. then that guy gets loose. Yeah. Yeah. Because wow. you know that's, that's one of those horror things. I'm keeping a zombie to study. I'm like, well, I know what's about to happen here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And can't just have a head, can you? I thought it was really cool how um, on the DVD they 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 gave three alternate endings. Interesting. One of them wow. where Killing Murphy dies. Huh. Another one. I, I'm like drawing a blank here. Yeah. Joe, you need to rewatch it. Yeah, it's, it's been it's a while. Such a good movie. And, one of the alternate endings uh, is he wakes up and it was all a dream to him, which I think is 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 cool. Really, I don't remember what the third. Al- you're you're, you're okay with the middle finger? The, I don't. When, like, whenever I don't. someone does the dream part, I'm like, Ooh, after all this, no, I, I don't like that. I, I don't mind that at all. Uh, I don't I even, mind any sort of twist. I hate when I see a horror oh. movie and. 100%. Something happens to the lead character, and you're like, "Oh my god!" And then they wake up screaming, and I'm like, "Oh, you son of a! <laughs> I hate when they give us that dream sequence, man." I like it in, in funny movies when something happens, and then like you know, the person winds up naked, not naked, but like I don't know, something crazy happens, and they start screaming because it's their worst nightmare, and then they wake up from it. I'm okay yeah. with that. Duffy in the shower. But one of the problems I had with Fight well, Club, what, yeah, and yeah. one of my favorite movies of all time is Fight Club, but I don't like the ending. I just don't like the ending. Oh, it was mm. the same guy. Yeah. No, no, that's not how you paint your. That's not how you get out of a painted painting yourself into a corner. Yeah, that to me that seemed like a twist just for t- the sake of a twist. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, quickly about the dream sequences on television. Entire seasons of television were dismissed with a dream sequence in Dallas. Uh, the New Heart show when he wakes oh, up. the whole so the whole funny. series Suzanne, was a is it dream Suzanne yeah, is, where they wake something? up next to or the whole series was sweetheart. a dream or it was the imagination of an autistic boy <laughs> yeah what's that yeah. one uh, saying else saying elsewhere. elsewhere yeah yeah, elsewhere. yeah. What? it was all the imagination of a little boy yeah yeah one of the one of the characters uh, uh it was a snow globe yeah. or something yeah yeah and i was like okay so, all right and then lost tried to do it can we do a thing it's all purgatory Right. <laughs> that, yeah, I kind of knew cool. when you had the polar bear, this is where we were going to go. Yeah. Now, Andrew, they did 28 Days Later. I don't seem to recall seeing 28 Weeks Later. What do, so what that, do you... Yeah, that came out five years later in 2007. Um, I saw it in the theater. I liked it, but it did not have the same punch as the first one, yeah. in my opinion. The opening was great. See, I, see I, I only saw it once in the theater when it came out. I don't remember every... Oh yeah, yeah. With um, and the, the house, and he's running to the yeah, boat. Yeah, and then the the kid is like left in in the house, yeah. and he has to go out with the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, after that, I need to rewatch that. Yeah. Um, but that movie introduced us to Rose Byrne, Jeremy Renner, and Idris Elba. That was, at least for me, wow, that was the first Great time cast. I, I wow. saw those guys. Um, and now we but, could expect the third movie of. Uh, who uh, who could have predicted it was going to be a trilogy? Twenty eight years, 20 years later, later, June of next year, it comes out. Wow! And the see the second movie didn't have the same writer and director, uh, Danny Boyle, yeah. directing and um, Alex Garland writing. They're bringing those guys back to do the third one, which I'm so excited for. And of course, they're bringing Killian Murphy back. Um, Aaron Taylor Johnson, who's going to be the new James Bond, he's going to be in this. Yeah. And who was the female that they? Jodie Comer, if if you know who she is, she's going to be in that. 
Um, so I think it's going to be good. I have high hopes for it. Okay. Yep. Now, since we're on the topic of zombie movies as uh, post-apocalyptic movies, I just want to throw out a couple of titles that I enjoy. Again, I'm looking for a, a twist on this, you know, uh, trope of, of zombie movies. Loved Zombieland. Absolutely yes. loved Zombieland with yep. Jesse Eisenberg, Emma Stone, and Woody Harrelson. Was oh, fantastic. Did you, did you see it. the sequel? Uh, no, I never got around to seeing the sequel. Yeah. It, it, it's it's only like slightly not as good as the first one, but it's definitely yeah. it's very entertaining and worth watching. The first one <clears throat> had arguably the greatest celebrity cameo of all time, and Bill, that's Bill, Bill Murray, Murray playing yeah. himself <laughs> in this zombie, futuristic zombie world in L.A., and uh, one of the great lines, Mr. Murray, do you have any regrets? Uh, Garfield, maybe. <laughs> that was just awesome. That was so good. Um, another movie that uh, is kind of along the same lines. I, they, I think, did they do it first? Yeah, they did it first. Uh, and this is a trilogy I want to talk about, and that's Shaun of the Dead, 2004, followed by Hot Fuzz, 2007, and then culminating with The World's End, 2013. They This is referred to as the Cornetto Trilogy oh, yeah. because there's uh, references to Cornetto ice cream, I guess, throughout the entire trilogy. Yeah. Um, but s- some of my favorite actors, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Martin Freeman, uh, are in The World's End. And you get the same actors in all three movies, and all three movies feel like they're connected in the same universe, but the actors are not playing the same characters in all right. movies. But... Again, taking that zombie theme and making putting a, the comedy spin on it, Shaun of the Dead is one of my favorite movies to watch when Halloween rolls around. Yes. And when oh, someone well, says, the- you know, recommend something I watch for Halloween, I'm like, have you seen Shaun of the Dead? Not a lot of people have, and it is freaking great. I'm yeah. drawing a blank on the one with uh, Adam Driver and Bill Murray. It just and it had um, was it the the Dead Don't Die? Yeah, the Dead Don't uh, Die. I want to see that. I that was a, that was a good it. movie. If you get a chance, watch. I'll, I'll say watch it. Was, was it, that it was, directed by uh, Jim Jarmusch? It might have been. It was. It was entertaining. I had a little uh, thing with it uh, near the end, but the, the ending bothered me. But overall, I was like, "Oh, this is kind of this is a funny. That's a funny, entertaining movie." Mm-hmm. The now, best part, I think. Let me just jump in if you ahead. don't mind. The best part of Shaun of the Dead, which made me laugh, I had to rewind it two or three times, is where they're discussing the vinyls. Yeah. That they're gonna throw at the zombies. Oh, they, yeah, I I laughed so hard. I think I cried. It was just because <laughs> no no no. One. It can't get not Frampton. I can't remember what it was, but he just kept and they kept throwing them at them. And I thought <laughs> this is so I love when talk. they're they're like so clueless that what's unfolding around them, and as this female zombie is approaching them, the, the one guy's like, she really likes you. Yeah. Like they have no idea that everyone's getting infected. They're in the the grocery store, and there's a zombie coming at him, and he opens the freezer door, and it hits him and knocks it over. That's what I love about it, these two clueless doofuses totally unaware of what's happening around them. Eventually, it kind of devolves into typical zombie fare, but up until that, the the, the humor in it is just great. And then the other two movies, uh, Hot Fuzz and uh, World's End, those kind of dabble in sci-fi Alien invasion, secret cults, all this stuff. So all three of those movies kind of dabble in the apocalypse in some form. But if you're ever looking for something to watch, watch those three movies. They are just, all of them are laugh out loud funny, really creative, really clever. Uh, And then the last movie I just kind of want to throw out uh, before we go around the table is uh, I Am Legend. Uh, Will Smith uh, came out 2007. Um, and that was like a virus too, wasn't it? Yeah. Like it was a virus that kind of took out most of the population. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the final movie on my That top was when a government engineered vaccination gone wrong. Yeah. You know, that helped I, with people. I like that movie and it came with, I think two alternate endings. Yeah. And I really appreciated seeing the alternate endings because one of them was they kind of all live happily ever after. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I'm so glad that they didn't, you know, have the zombies. Like one zombie woman was in love with a man zombie and they wanted to go off and have baby zombies. I don't know. It didn't make any sense to me. But I am I saw that and I thought that was an interesting way to go. That would have brought it down 20, 30% in my opinion because it just wasn't 
Mm. It wasn't yeah, realistic. It didn't fit the rest of it. It didn't fit the rest yeah, yeah. of it. It barred that Twilight Zone thing where he was the monster. They were just the people. He was capturing oh, yeah, them. That's a good point. Yeah. He was capturing them and experimenting on them. They're like, you're just taking our people and experimenting on them. You're the monster. We're not. You know, you're the one that sets up booby traps oh, wow. and hunting people. You're the one with the mental issues. Oh, sorry. You know, I think that is so fascinating. Because that was they, they did that in a Twilight Zone episode. And so that's why I started to see those elements. And now we're talking about the alternate ending. They chose the happy one because that's what the sequel's based off of because Will Smith's in it. Did they choose the mm-hmm. happy one where the two get together? Well, yeah, well, well, no, 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 where he lives. Oh, he, okay, okay, that's yeah, right. Okay. Where he lives because that's, that's what they're using to make I Am Legend 2 now. Oh, when's okay. that coming out? That's sometime in 2025. Hmm. Oh, I no. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, uh, something I wanted to mention when we were talking about the Cornetto trilogy, a lot of times when you talk about uh, the world's end, which is basically these friends going on a 12 pub crawl as the world kind of collapses around them. And the last pub is called the world's end. Um, when you talk, when you say, Hey, have you seen the world's end? They're like, is that the one with James Franco? Now that's another sort of an apocalyptic movie, isn't it? This is the end where do they play? They play versions of themselves, right? So you got James Franco was Seth Rogen, isn't he in it? Uh, yeah, so that's, Hill. that one's uh, kind of fun, too. That one's kind of a silly uh, buddy thing where they all get together and just have fun making a movie. So, uh, All right, Nick, uh, that's my top ten list. What uh, what did you bring to the table that we haven't talked about? Well, we talked about World War Z, so that was on there. I enjoy Children of Men, the one with uh, Clive Owen and Julianne Moore. It's where uh, oh, no. the, uh, a, a, a pandemic great, hit great that movie. where – all of a sudden, humanity was threatened with infertility. There was no more children being born. And then mm. he, he comes across a lady who's pregnant, and he's tasked with getting her to safety so they can help try to figure out how to get humans to have babies again. And it was a, when you hear about it, it didn't get a lot of marketing. It just came, you see the trailer, like, wait, what the, what is this? And then yeah. I saw it in the theater, I went, this is, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. And it got, it's one of those slow burns where people, like, they didn't have any marketing behind it. So when people saw it, it got, it, it was nominated for three Oscars. Huh. It got BAFTA nominations, and it's it's it was a very well done movie. So that that stand, it hits all, almost all because there's ecocide, wars breaking out, and people are coming to England because England's one of the few countries that still managed to hold off and maintain infrastructure. So mm-hmm. it and it talks about you know what would happen then authoritarianism would take over because there's too many people flooding in. This is well before Brexit, mm-hmm. so you kind of like they're painting the future like <laughs> I kind of see it coming. Yeah, and yeah. Boris was there. Um. I've never seen it. I, I don't yeah, know anything about it. I would recommend it. I'll, I'll add it to my, uh, it, my list. It's ex- What's the name of this? Children of Men. Oh, yeah, I got that. Down. I wrote it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, the director, uh, Alfonso Cuaron. Yeah, Alfonso, did, um, yeah. Gravity with Sandra Bullock. Did yeah, you see yeah. that? Oh, yeah. He did the third Harry Potter movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The only good one. So yeah. I hear. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but no, Joe, it is excellent. All right. It's, but it's, it's very, it's very bleak. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. It's not the road bleak with the Vigo Mortensen. That's another one. If you ever get that's a chance, what that's, I was gonna that's, that's just I'm like, well, there's no sun anymore. There's no sunlight. There's no happiness or joy. <laughs> Whoever wrote this, Perish. come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> a hug would only bring you back to like depression. <laughs> like it'll elevate you to depression. Uh, the, no, but the other movie that um I I was looking at was a uh, Rain of Fire. That was Christian Bale, Gerard Butler. It was about dragons. Uh, so mm. it's set it's again set in England. Uh, a, a tunneling crew while fixing the underground comes across a dragon that was once locked away. And it, once it ca- comes out, it starts just wreaking havoc on people. Huh. It's the one male. And basically it was, there's one male and a bunch of females. That's all. And so the dragons start to mu- multiply astronomically and it's now, you know, in the future and people have, to, they have, it, it's very well done. Hmm. It, 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 Matthew McConaughey that. plays a villain in that movie. He gives an um, amazing role. When you see, huh. you're like, that's Matthew McConaughey. He is shredded, bald, and he is like full on dragon psycho, like hmm. Captain Ahab on steroids and some PCP. Wow. Cool. And some PCP. And some, uh, maybe Again, a lot of PCP. Another film that was, yeah, just, he, was never been on my radar. I had no idea what it was about. So. Yeah. Rain of Fire. Nice. Interesting. Very well done. And then, uh, yeah, I'd say, I think those, those were the ones that, because a lot of the other ones we touched on. Um, yeah. Uh, oh no. Oh and yes. My 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 camp one. I found this one. <laughs> Escape from New York. Oh, that's Kurt you Russell. Stole one. it from me. I love <laughs> now that. I'm mad. And I'm then, mad that that wasn't on my top ten list. I you recently stole it from me. I was hung, hoping to keep that one quiet. <laughs> came, so out in, sleep came out in '81 and said this is set in 1997. And I saw it again in 1997. <laughs> when 
Yeah. It's yeah, funny because that came out before Terminator, didn't it? it 19, yeah, I think 1981. Was it before that? Yeah. And so, <clears throat> and, and Kurt Russell is just awesome. Yeah. And oh, I love the, the premises that New York gets so bad. Because if you remember the 70s, this is before Roe v. Wade, right? So you have all these, I don't know if you've ever watched Freakonomics, but Freakonomics goes through the fact that in, in the late 80s, the reason that New York turns itself around is because all the little kids that weren't born never became adults. And so therefore, all the police and all the mayor and, you know, Mayor uh, Koch at the time, they were all patting each other on the back saying, well, you've cleaned up New York. No, the reality was women got to, anyway, this is, I'm not trying to be political, yeah. But when we saw that movie in like 1981, it was right after the 70s. And if you ever watched yeah. Taxi Driver, De Niro says, you know, one of these days, a real rain is going to come and clean this place up. Because it was at, at its very lowest point. I mean, oh, that, yeah. That, that, and so it wasn't hard to believe in Times 81. Times Square had, had porno theaters. And, yeah, exactly. And all that it was just oh, sure. absolutely terrible. Yeah, and the so, premise of Escape from New York is they just give up on it. They, yes, Let's that's build it. a wall around it. Right. It's an Keep island. Keep the vermin it's, it's a, in there. And it's a prison complex. Parachute in the back. Because there's parachute a war, there's a war between concept. China and the Soviet Union have united, and it's a war. And I'm like, oh, boy, you guys are a carpenter. I'm like, John, what were you on? <laughs> but yeah. yeah, yeah, and so I saw that one, and they go 1997, and then I keep going, oh boy, okay, here we are. <laughs> this is like Back to the Future 2015, flying cars. Yeah. <laughs> now I revisited uh, uh, Escape from New York not too long ago, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, the only thing I, I almost wish they would do like a George Lucas style revisit, redo the soundtrack. The yeah. soundtrack is basically John Carpenter on a keyboard going. That's it. Like the same note. It's like okay, let's get an orchestra in here. Bring in John Williams. Did what he could with the Halloween money. Imagine what John Williams' score would do for that movie. Oh my god. Um, the other cool thing about Escape from New York, and I, I found out about this after the fact, because a lot of times I'll be sitting there watching a movie, and I'll, I'll bring up IMDb, and I'll read some little trivia and facts and stuff, and, and then I'll look at some of the extras on the DVD. And there's a scene where they're, they're kind of going toward Manhattan, and there's like a computer grid or something of the skyline of New York, and it says day glow, green stripes or whatever, as they're trying to find a landing spot or whatever. And this was pre- computer animation days so basically what they did they did is they they built the skyline of manhattan in miniature and they filmed that then they painted the whole skyline black and lined every building with like green fluorescent tape and then they filmed those scenes and pretended that it was like a computer generated image and i'm like wow. those guys were thinking outside the box back then cool. they couldn't create it on a computer so they kind of visualize what it might look like and did it practically and i think that's brilliant and, yeah really and cool. they they did a great job and then unfortunately the sequel suffered from the beyond thunderdome yeah escape same from LA. concept yeah. over the top some of the uh you know it's terrible like some the of the acting effects. is over everybody's I, they made this movie just to make it yeah you know i went capitalize uh, on the you know other, other than steve buscemi being the movie i went, I went this <laughs> this is no that's why I don't acknowledge it. I, I, but it has to be in there. But I just say Escape from New York. No, that's a I good love one. Escape I, from New I York. regret not having that on my top ten list. That's a great addition. Andrew, what are you bringing on? Anything uh, we haven't touched on uh, yet? I was going to talk about uh, the two Quiet Place movies, which oh, okay. I absolutely yeah. love. Those are cool. Mm -hmm. um, I saw both of them opening night when they came out, and I thought they were excellent. Uh, John Krasinski, who everyone knows as Jim from The Office, mm -hmm. plays the... I don't know if it, I'd say the anti Jim, but he's uh, it might be Jim if he was in that situation. I don't know. No. Now, if he ever learned to stop his wisecracks. Now, did he uh, did he meet Emily Blunt on this film, or were they husband and wife before they did? Before the film? they were they were yeah. before. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Because I, I think she she was, I think I read she was approached to star in it first, and she talked to him, or was it no, the no, other no. way around? He, he wrote it. He wrote it, and then he was huh. going to pitch it to one of their friends, and she goes. Well, I can do it. And oh, yeah, yeah. I knew it was. It, but he one was like, of them was connected. And but this is funny. one of those things. What do I direct my wife? What if I, she doesn't take my direction? Yeah. That's what he was freaking out about. And then she was like, oh, my God, you're right. Uh -huh. So they were a little apprehensive about doing that. And then they were finally like, oh, we, we can make it work. We'll do it. Let's, just, let's, let's try it. And hopefully it doesn't blow up the marriage. I love Emily right. Blunt. She's and, fantastic. Uh, now, do they explain great. in the film what's the source of the terror? Like, how did this happen? So in, in the second one, it starts off. Sort of on day one, 
Oh, okay. And and we'll get to it in a minute. They're coming out with the third mo- the yeah, movie, yeah. which is a prequel, uh, next month. Um, but yeah, it's a meteorite that crashes. I I believe in New York. Several, s- yeah. Or mm-hmm. several meteorites that crash, and, and just let these aliens these loose that are forms. blind, but that they use go off right. of uh, off of uh, audio. Hmm. Um, kudos to John Krasinski directing, co-writing yeah. the script and starring in the movie. That's that's a lot for yeah. one person to do. And he pulled it off. Um, it, it it's a, a horror movie though that that still kind of makes you feel good about like a loving family and sacrifice and yeah. uh, self reliance and things like that. Um, it's not even though the the ending isn't great. Not everyone survives. We'll put it that way. But well, there's the one scene. Hopefully, people have seen the movie. And we're not spoiling anything, but. When I finally got around to seeing the movie, I watched it on cable TV or whatever, and fairly early on in the film, I got to say, the, the first movie contains one of the biggest gut punches I've ever seen in a movie, and that's when they had gone out to get some supplies. They're trying to get back home, and that little kid yeah. <laughs> pulls out the toy car, and I'm like, the one that he, The one that he took from the store, which they were telling him not to take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I and to, to have his family witness yeah. that unfold and i'm like i don't know if this movie's for me because that was, <laughs> that was horrific. devastating, it, it was like, devastating. You said, like you said it happens pretty early on too yeah, and, yeah. but it sets the tone for the rest yeah. of the movie yeah. which yeah. is painful but it's uh and you have the daughter who's deaf and then that's why she kind of like yeah when she when she lost you know her her sibling that yeah that that part because she 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 kind of blamed herself. She had that guilt. Maybe as she like looked back or like kept an eye on him because right. there was there was sign language like keep an eye on your brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And that's that what brutal. I love about. There's some movies where it's and and Joe. There's probably a term that you know better than I do. It's not the. It's like if you watch the original George A. Romero, you know, Night of the Living Dead, isn't it Night of the Living Dead? Yeah. The '68. Okay. Yeah. It's not the zombies. The zombies are. You know, you see the zombies. And they go, oh, that's cool. That's part of it, but that's not the movie. The movie is what happens when a group of people together face something that's never been faced together. Mm-hmm. If you look at it that way, Alien and Aliens is just a subset of that, mm-hmm. and Jurassic Park is just a subset of that. And there's just a ton of movies where something happens and everybody is suddenly thrust into a situation they've never been into. And we don't even have to talk about. We don't even have to see right. really the zombies or things. And you you don't even really see this guy till the very end. Of uh, I think part is it part one or part two where you see his ear and all that kind of thing. Um, for the quiet for the, place for the alien. Yeah, for, are we still talk, we're still talking about quiet place, right? Yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And isn't it the part where his you see his ear and how they turn up the sound really loud yeah, yeah, yeah. and all yeah. that? Right. Okay, so yeah. the, uh-huh. the alien's ear. Oh, okay. You don't really need to see it. It's like it's like the shark in in uh, Jaws. Yeah. They had problems with the shark, and so you don't really see it. I love yeah. the fact that it's, it, or if you see signs, uh, Shamal, and I love the movie Signs. I've seen this so many times. You only see snippets of it, and it makes a hundred times scarier. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, they kind of ruin, not ruin it. It's cool, but they finally trot out the alien. But um, well, to, to further your point, and, and when yeah. you were talking about uh, you know the zombie movies and stuff. None of these movies work if you don't care about the characters. So you yes. you have to have an investment in these characters and care what happens to them. Um, but if it's just like a slaughterhouse, like take yes. uh, take the King Kong on Skull Island, the whole movie oh, yeah. was like, let's how many creative ways can we pick off each character one by one? And I'm like, that's not no entertaining to me. I need to care about these characters. I like, want uh, them uh, to be okay. Like, Which is why Sharknado is such <laughs> an important movie. <laughs> that's or, right. or Godzilla Minus One. Yeah, where you care about those yeah. characters. Yeah, you I care what happens. I love that movie. God, yeah, that was yeah. fantastic. I did love those movies. And that's exactly the point, is they're all reacting to this thing that's bigger than them, and it's driving everybody nuts, and it's the elephant in the room everywhere yeah. you go. Yeah. And, you know, I think about, you were talking about Alien, in the, the original Alien movie and the sequel, you care about the characters. You, you care about what happens. So, yeah. the problem when they came up with uh, came out with uh, Alien versus Predator is 
they're like, oh, the fans want to see aliens and predators on screen at the same time. And they focused all their energy on that. And they throw the human characters yeah. in who we didn't give a crap about. <laughs> and so as they're getting picked off one by one, you're like, who cares? And and that's why that movie's forgettable. In Jurassic Park, you care about what happens to these characters. Even Nedry, the villain, you're like, oh, man, what a gruesome end. Um, so, yeah, for any of these movies where post-apocalyptic horror movies or whatever, you have to care about these characters. Yeah. 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 Um, something that, that I, I, I didn't realize that Quiet Place made this much money, um, but it made... Three hundred and forty-one million on a seventeen million budget. Wow. But so how did they? How did they do that? I, wow. I, was it in theaters? I thought it was free on Netflix. Not the Ooh. first one. No, no. No, they both. They were both released in theaters. Yeah, so yeah. both on oh. theaters. So that's it. Made twenty times. Yeah. its budget, good which is pretty good if you think about it. Well, to take it's you know, you look at budget. something like yeah. the the Blair Witch Project, yeah, which was, was like say, shot on <laughs> camcorders. Made an Shaky ungodly cam. amount of money. I think, if, I don't know if it dynamite. still holds today, but it's probably one of the most profitable movies yeah, ever made. Yeah, in terms of how many times yeah. it made back. It, it's got to be crazy. Wow. Um, and then uh, Quiet Place 2. So that's one of those movies that it had its premiere in New York City um, in March of March 8th of 2020. Oh, wow. It happened a couple days later. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. And I, I totally forgot this. It got pushed back a whole year. Yeah. Uh, 14 months. It didn't right, actually right. come out till May of 21. Yeah. And so it had a budget of $61 million. It still made almost $300 million, which yeah. is good for Not coming out in 2021. Yeah. Right. And you got to imagine, what if COVID never happened? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, it would have made half a million, I think. It's appropriate um, that on a discussion about post-apocalyptic movies, we got to talk gotta about talk 2020. About, yeah, you got to. We're yeah. living in a post-apocalyptic world right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so it picks, that movie picks up a year. I'm not going to spoil it too much because you haven't seen it, Joe, but it picks up a year after mm -hmm. the first one ends. Uh, they come across Killian Murphy, who we previously talked about. Mm -hmm. Another excellent role. Everything that guy does is excellent. And, uh, the only other, uh, actor really in that movie is, uh, uh, Jiman Hansu. Jiman Hansu, yeah, from, uh. Jiman Hansu, he's Am the African. Amistad, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's you'd, you'd, so you'd recognize him. Cool. Yeah, he's um, in the Constantine. They, towards the end of the mo movie, they they get to an island where you think it's safe, and that guy is, is kind of like the leader of the island. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything else, but <laughs> it is it's one of the rare sequels. I I think is just as good as the first one. Yeah, I I loved it. You know, you just got me thinking that a common theme with post apocalyptic movies isn't so much the threat of the zombies or the virus or whatever it's mankind yeah. and they're it, they always in these movies they split into these factions and happened in the walking dead and all this other stuff there's there's the people who try to restore things the way they were and there are people who seize the opportunity to try and take over and create lawlessness and yeah. sex slaves yeah. and um yeah so that's kind of an interesting uh theme on he these movies he pointed at you when he said <laughs> well, sex no he brought it <laughs> no, up earlier what kidding. was the movie 28 you days later 28 days later they get to the army base <laughs> but so, no you're right yeah. and and it's it's a sort of thing where you're when you make these kind of movies you're sort of allowed to play with the human condition. How are people going Be to because react? Because you, you yes. have this, you have this third thing out here, the villain or the zombie or whatever, that you could sort of triangulate good versus bad humans. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. I mean that that's the, that's the the essence of World War Z. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. It's, exactly. The zombies are there. It's a it's the it's a social commentary. It's one of the best ones out there. If you get a chance, yeah. you can read the book. It's not like a Harry Potter book. It's not going to be that big. It's about that big. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, me, for people that can't see it, I don't know why. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not the. It's about maybe a couple hundred pages, maybe three hundred pages. No, a couple hundred. And yeah. like I said, if you don't want to do that, listen to the audio mm -hmm. book. It's a full cast: Nathan Fillion, Mark Hamill. Uh, you know, hmm. it, it was very well done. That's awesome. George, any uh, final uh, movies you want to throw out there? Any final titles? The Hunger Games. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Because that, uh, that the came Hunger up, Games, uh, because I I really do like it. It turns into d twelve districts. Some people think it's just a cutesy little movie, and it is, and it and it and it appeals to the 14, 14 year old in me and every other teenage girl in the United States. But I really like, I really like Elizabeth. What's her name? Is Elizabeth Banks? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who yeah. plays, and I really love. Uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Lawrence. Or? Jennifer Lawrence is obviously Stanley, absolutely. Stanley Tucci. Sure. Stanley Tucci yeah. is my favorite role in that. <laughs> Donald Sutherland is, of yeah. course, fantastic. Oh, yeah. And there is there is an element of cheese and an element of overdoing it. But I really, I, I, the first time I saw it, I was like, eh. And then I saw the second one, I thought, well, I got to go back to the first one because I really liked the first one. And it's a whole universe into its own. And you can, you know, it's kind of, and then there was Maze Runner and then there's uh, Diver, it was Divergent. Divergent. Yeah, yeah the, the and whole genre came. The whole genre that, yeah, came yeah. after that. So there's a bunch of stuff that's all kind of along those post-apocalyptic that I think we we missed. I actually really like those. It's I think it's mostly for you know gum snapping teenagers, but I enjoyed them. I think that's fantastic, yeah. and I love seeing I love seeing uh, this weird relationship between um, oh uh, Woody Harrelson and oh. Jennifer Lawrence, and I love seeing Lenny Kravitz. Yeah. Damn it, he got <laughs> killed. I could kill oh. somebody for that. He was such a he was one of the coolest. He was like warm hearted and. It's like the same thing with you know when Sean Bean dies in yeah. Game of Thrones. It's like I just want to get up and walk out. It's just like I want my money back. <laughs> Here's your damn popcorn. I haven't finished it. Here's, it. but I loved it because uh, there there are some parallels with how we have gotten to the point where entertainment is watching other people there, uh, uh, suffer. So the. I think the Running Man. Did you ever see that? Oh, yeah. I love the Running. Yeah, yeah the yeah, Running yeah. Man's another one on my list. Um, I don't know if that's alternate universe as much as maybe it is post-apocalyptic, but they, it actually creates a game around it. Yeah. And if we go back even further, uh, Logan's Run, but that might mm. just be a future movie. It's not right. a post. There was no apocalypse person. Well, there was actually because was they it? when they leave the city, it's all been destroyed. I don't know. Who knows. Okay. Yeah, that's um, why that's why they didn't put Blade Runner in there because Blade. Oh, Blade is Runner is just a future movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I I want to kind of go back to Hunger Games. I want to give you my spin on it. I'm sure. kind of the opposite of you. So you know, there's all this buzz around the Hunger Games. I went to go see it in the theater. I can't remember if there's people with me. I have to assume there are people with me. Otherwise, I think I may have walked out. And and here's the reason. So I'm watching the movie. I'm kind of getting into it. And then they go to start the Hunger Games. And if, if correct me if I'm wrong, but near the start of the Hunger Games, there's this big cornucopia or something. Yeah. And when they say go, everyone rushes to the cornucopia to get weapons and stuff. And I'm sitting there watching kids get slaughtered, older teenagers slaughtering a young girl. And I felt sick to my stomach. That's a I, really good point. I sat there like, what am I seeing here? Why is this considered entertainment? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just wired differently, but I felt sick and never got into the movie the rest of the way. Never saw any of the movies that came after it. I, I got really sort of disenchanted with filmmaking that someone thought that this would be wow. entertaining, watching kids get slaughtered and murdered, even in a fantasy setting, but it just wasn't my thing. And uh, so, yeah, Hunger Games Respect. is just not I mean, I my get that. thing. I get that, yeah. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard I will to say that. that my kids read the books first, mm -hmm. and to, you know, to have it in the books where people are like, you know, don't mention suicide around kids, don't mention murder, don't mention bringing guns to school, all that. I 100% yeah, yeah. respect and agree with that. And this is just kind of how it went. This is, you know, the Hunger Games is kind of somebody who'd said, let's go there and mm -hmm. see what happens. And the kids, my, my girls, my son, they, they, uh, they really related to that. And mm -hmm. so I kind of got dragged into it. I had a hard time with it as well. But anyway, it's, it's there. It's interesting. It's, yeah. it's one of those fine lines with entertainment because in The Quiet Place, you never see the alien kill the kid. Right, it's just, just kind of—it's it, implied. You just—it's the blur. It's, it's the blur, and you—it would be too too painful yeah. as an audience to yeah. see a kid get get beheaded or but, whatever. Yeah. And then, and this is where Steven Spielberg walked that line in Jaws when the when the Kittner boy gets eaten. Oh, they, yeah. They, it was much more gruesome. Yeah, they the way had to he tone envisioned it down. Yeah, 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 this one he's because they, the shark didn't work the way he wanted to. Yeah. So they had to improvise it, and so what you see that made it on there. He felt, oh boy, and, and there were people that at the time felt, oh, I don't know how I feel about this, but they did it. That's, yeah. th th that's like that jump, th that point of no return. It's like if you go to <laughs> get right up there, like, oh my God, it's it's cinematic, amazing. You just made me, you made me think about it. But then if you saw the kid getting like eh, ripped apart, and gutted, <laughs> like, oh, okay. yeah, like you yeah. know, you see the knife sticking, like it's like it's no, like, I don't want to see that. It's like I'm, saving I'm, Private I'm on Ryan Joe's when when he's like up him, yeah. up him. Uh, I see Nothing. the blade get pushed in, like oh come yeah. on. Now you got me thinking. Imagine you're sitting there watching Jurassic Park, 
and the scene where the T-Rex eats the blood-sucking lawyer who's sitting on the toilet, that was like played for a laugh. Now imagine it was Timmy. Imagine putting Timmy. That's not going to be played for. You're going to be like, "Come on, Stephen, what's wrong with you?" I mean, when he kind of when he when he kind of do that, you know, kind of fried the kid. (laughs) You're like, he's going to get up, right? This is dark, Stephen. Please get up. You know what's funny? And the murder of children isn't the worst thing that people can experience in a film. I know a lot of people who say, "If you kill that dog, you've lost me." So like, there's like adults. Kids, and then don't mess with the pets. Do not kill the dog. And I'm like, you know what? I can kind of see that. I mean, uh, Stephen even does in Schindler's List, the girl with the red dress. Oh, and you're like, brutal. Oh, that's you brutal. brutal. We, you're right. We understand oh. it, but he didn't have to go and he's like, we will show you what it is. Like, no, Stephen, <laughs> I get it. I know what this is about. I think in that yeah. situation, though, it wasn't played for entertainment. It was it was more oh, for like, like man, this, to... this crap really happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but they, but they just showed it. They didn't show... Like, they just showed the coat on the pile right. of clothing. Yeah, yeah so yeah. then, so I said that's that line where it's artistic and dramatic, and you stop yeah. right about there. Otherwise, yeah, uh, you lose the audience. Yeah, yeah, otherwise, you're in Hunger Games. In any case, it slip, lost me. It lost the me. Yeah. Throat. Yeah. yeah, I have one more. Go ahead, yeah. Snowpiercer. Did you see oh, that? Oh yeah, I did. I enjoyed that. I, I, I think it. I like. Okay, I have a lot of problems with it. Mm-hmm. A lot of problems with it. But it's so unique. And it's so strange, and Tilda Swinton is so fantastic in it. Tilda, yeah. And uh, who else is it? Is it Ben Kingsley? I can't remember. Oh, no. Anyway, no. it's such a weird environment that it it got under my radar, got under my my it got into my operating system for a while, and it was just something I could not couldn't stop thinking about the kids that grow up doing this thing where they're taking because there's parts missing, and so they replace yeah. them with human beings and. There's who's, all these cars. The that? Evans? Chris Evans. Chris, Chris Evans, Evans yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They did a TV show later on, but because in, initially when I saw it, I was like, so who who fixes the railroad tracks? Because that thing's going to bend on some yeah. parts. Now, the premise Never of that, that. The, world, yeah. <laughs> the world's a big snowball in that movie, yeah. right? That's the premise is that it had frozen over and societies live on these trains that I was like, are who, who wrote that movie's right? never written Amtrak? <laughs> I'm like, come on, buddy. There's maintenance guys sitting the, in a theater. That's the going, one where on. that's that's the situation where those there's just gigantic <laughs> gaps in like I don't understand like this doesn't make any sense. And if yeah. you just sat there, you just like how the how do the people not in the back continue to get their arms and legs and right. things cut off and not get <laughs> pissed off and I don't know. And then and then you find out the front's talking to the back and they're all in on it together. It's like, well, what? What's the point? <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, I don't know. All right. There's a reason why it was the last movie brought up today <laughs> on our post-apocalyptic theme. Uh, all right. We're going to wrap things up, guys. That was a fun chat yeah. as always. And uh, we will see you again in a couple of weeks. Come to the movies. Watch Charlie Chaplin. And put some sunshine into your day Forget the hard times Come to the movies And try to laugh your troubles away